So the last lesson we spoke about those things which are permissible as jais in the Ramans, then breaking the Ramans, and then we finished off with uh, abandoning the Ramans. A person who uh, doesn't pray his five daily prayers, he purposely uh, misses his salah. So inshallah, today we're going to begin with um, riding an animal, i.e. when we're traveling, um, we read our salah, maybe in a car, modern times it would be doing namaz in a car, on a plane, caravan, and so on. So inshallah, bismillah ar-Rahman rahim So praying uh, on a riding animal, it says, Fard and Waji prayers are invalid if performed on a riding animal or in a vehicle. So this is the first masala that I mentioned here. As we know, Namaz has Fard, Waji, Sunnat, Sunnat, Ghair, Mawqida and Nafal. There's different levels of uh, Ibadat, right? For example, we have Zohar Namaz, we have four Sunnah Mawqida, four Fard, two Sunnah Mawqida and then we have two Nafal. So the main thing here that the fard and the wajib. Fard will be two fard of fajr, four fard of zohar, four of asr, four, three of maghrib, four of isha, and four of zohar. If I can mention those. And the two fard of juma namaz, for example. These are the fard. Wajib would be the three bitter only. So the three bitter of isha and the fard, they have to be led standing on the ground. You have to in the condition that we mentioned before of prayer that standing is far, reciting Quran is far, ruku is far, sajda is far, and the qaida, the attahiyat is far. All these actions are far in the mass, but they are only far in the far the mass, right? And they are only far in the winter the mass, like the standing and the ruku, uh, practically doing them. As for the other prayers, the Sunnah Ghair Mu'akkadah, Sunnah Mu'akkadah and Nafal, they are the ones that you can sit down and read. You know, generally in Taraweeh, for example, people sit down and sometimes read the Taraweeh. Or the two Nafal in the normal prayers, people sit down and read the two Nafals. The reward is halved when you sit down and pray. That's a general rule. But apart from the Fard and the Witr, you cannot sit down and read the prayers. And so these are the two prayers that cannot be sitting down. You have to stand up and read these. Even if you're traveling, so now if I'm traveling to, I don't know, Manchester, right? It's more than traveling distance. I'm a musafir. Can I read my Zohar Salah in the car? No, I can't. People often pray the namaz in the car and uh, they uh, think that because I'm a traveling, I'm a traveler, I'm allowed to pray my Salah sitting in the car. You are still not allowed to read the Fard Salah sitting down. The condition for the Fard is you stand up and read your Fard Namaz. So if you're in your own car, you stop at the service station, you stop at a safe place, and you won't stop at the hard shoulder and pray. Right? That would be Makru, because it's dangerous, first thing. Second thing, it's against the law to stop on the hard shoulder if you're not broken down. So you stop at a reasonable place, which would be like a service station, or you just jump out of a junction. And then you find a side road or a place to uh, pray uh, quietly where you're not disturbing anyone. So this will be the general rule that you need to stand up and pray your Fard Salah. Then he also mentioned the Sajda of Tilawat. So if you're reciting the Quran and Kareem whilst you're riding or you're driving in a car or someone else is reciting and you're listening, then you still have to do the Sajda. Now because you're there's different opinion. One is that imagine before you got into the car, you heard the Sajda of Tilawat. Now it was due before you got into the car. Right? But now when you're in the car and you heard it, you have the option you can do it in the car or you can get off and do the Sajda of Tilawat. 
But if it's G before the uh, journey or before you mount your vehicle, then uh, you have to transform it while standing on the ground and being proper sense down on the floor. You mentioned that sometimes out of necessity, majburi, you can pray these. So general rule is that you need to read your fard and with the namaz standing up. But out of necessity, you can pray these uh, prayers sitting down. And now lots of valid reason. Imagine it's extremely muddy. Soon as you put your face on the floor, it's covered in mud. Right? So in that situation, and that's the only possible scenario that you have. You're probably gone, I don't know, mountain climbing, climbing Mount Snowden or something for charity, inshallah. Yeah, so doing some sadqa work, you're in a place where you can't, uh, you don't find a place to pray that is solid or just uh, moist. And the only place you have to pray that if you put your face in the ground, all the mud will be all over your face. In that scenario, you stand up and you can stand up and pray in namaz. Why? Because that's a necessity now. Otherwise, all your clothes, all your musallah, everything is going to be uh, completely uh, full of mud. That's one example they give. Another example is that imagine you're traveling, and this um, can happen anywhere. That imagine you're traveling and you feel that you'd be attacked if you stop your car and get out and pray. Either you could be in a racist area, racist city, you could be in a place that is not racist like Pakistan, but you're just scared of your own people. Right? So it could be that kind of scenario. But wherever it is, obviously you have highway robbers everywhere. And they call them highway robbers, where they, if you stop your car, and then basically rob whatever you have with you. So if you're feeling for your life, feeling for your wealth, feeling for your safety generally, then in that scenario, that if I park my car up, something's gonna happen to me, I might be robbed. Not, it has to be, and it has to be uh, like, not just a, oh, you know, I've heard once upon a time someone got robbed here now. The fear has to be realistic. That you know that if you stop here from my knowledge and experience, that if you park up, if you get out of car here, you will be attacked. And it doesn't have to be a human being. It could be that you 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 know that there's wild animals there. It could be, you know, like any dangerous animals that are going to be hanging about uh, in those areas. Especially in Pakistan, the majority of us might be from like Kashmir. Uh, it's mostly village in, and it's not like a city. So hence, there is wildlife there. There is, you know, like a lot of people in Luton are from Kortali. So, yeah, so imagine you're in Kortali in the mountains and something pops up, right? So in that kind of uh, scenario, you find yourself. So in that scenario, now you know that is dangerous. Now you know your life's at risk or your wealth has a risk, your property, your car, whatever you're traveling on. In that scenario, you will be able to pray your salah in your vehicle. But that has to be realistic. So generally, you won't be allowed a prophet your sunnahs and nafas. And if you do pray sitting down, the reward is halved. So if you're in a masjid, you're comfortable, just out of laziness to say what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds from your salah, you don't stand up, you just half the reward. And as you know, we live in a uh, time that uh, every little counts. You know, every little deed that we're short of, that could be one good action, one deed that we could be short on your Qiyamah. So we should try our best that if you are paying a manamaz, we would rather just do the full thing. And, and yeah. Is it also hard if you fear for your life or something? Yeah, so that'll be like, obviously that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a, you could say, a leeway that the Sharia has given you. Uh, to, uh, and like obviously a person, it depends on your intention. Now like some people, uh, like you know, there's like, oh, I'm scared, but I'm saving some time, I'm saving some time, I'm saving my car. Now they're using that as in, like, I don't care, I just want to get the responsibility off my shoulders. He wasn't reading the Salah with the passion. One is you read with sincerity, with ikhlas, and now you have to do half, or you have to pray in your car. In that scenario, that person, his reward won't be half. Why? Because his intention is to do properly. Because the scenario he finds himself in, he has to play, uh, pray in his car. 
But whereas um, a person who's you say excited and in that uh, that oh, I'm gonna sit down and pray, I got leeway, I couldn't bother to stand up anyway. Then obviously it's judged on inna mal a'malu biniyat. Actions are governed by intentions. Another thing that they mentioned here is anything that which is uh, considered to be mounted or attached to the ground, then that would be considered as part of the ground. Right? So like if you have the modern day caravan, uh, which you can pray inside, for example, that would be considered that it's, because once you park it up, you put your lever down, I'm sure you have those levers on it, right? It's considered that it's you parked it and you placed it on the ground. So now it's considered on the ground. Whereas if you have a big car, for example, and you park it up, that you still consider it on the right. So you have to get out the car and then pray your salah. And obviously that depends on uh, if you have a, if you do deliveries and you get a transit van, Mercedes, you can just jump in the back and pray your full salah standing up. Why? Because then you have enough space to pray standing up. And at the same time, it might be dangerous to pray outside. So you pray in the back and that be perfectly fine as well. There's a video that went viral that a person was Hala is praying on top of his taxi in America or something. Right? Uh, so, uh, in Times Square. Yeah, so he prayed on his car bonnet. Um, sometimes you might find yourself in an awkward situation. Uh, so you can um, obviously use your imagination and uh, be pray in a safe place. So obviously it doesn't have to be in a, a dangerous place like that as well. So you have to the Sharia doesn't this is the beauty of Islam that it doesn't make the deen hard. Our lack of knowledge of the deen makes it hard for us. Uh, so you know people say on oh, the deen's not uh, why do you guys make the deen so hard? Why is Islam so hard? The reality is it's our lack of knowledge of the deen that makes us feel that it's hard. Because if we knew the rules of the Sharia, the rules and regarding wudu, the rules regarding Taharat, for example, purification, the rules regarding the Salah, then we know how easy to pray our Salah. And how punctual, the more punctual we'll be in performing our five daily prayers. So he mentions here that you can't pray your salah uh, whilst walking. I don't know how someone's going to do that, but uh, according to the Hanafi school, that you can't pray your salah uh, whilst walking. I know there's a why they mentioned it, like sometimes you can pray the salah while the animal is moving. You're riding on an animal, i.e., you're the passenger in the car. Hopefully, you're not the driver, and the car's moving and you're reading in Namaz. Right? But if you're the passenger, you can read in a moving vehicle. Because it's a nafal namaz, for example, then facing the qibla is not a condition. Right? So for optional prayer, if you're reading and you're passenger in a car, imagine you're traveling down the motorway and you feel like reading two nafal as a passenger, you can't do so. Right? Even though the car is turning away from the qibla because you don't really have the uh, control of the vehicle. Same with a train, a plane, any vehicle that you're not in charge of, that you can't stop and park up and you can. Uh, the uh, Qibla uh, is what we consider because you don't have authority in that case. And so even if you pray your salah in a, a vehicle or a place uh, that is moving, and during the salah, the animal or the vehicle turns direction, then that's also uh, fine as well, as long as uh, you're fulfilling the conditions. So, if you just take the chair next door.
So you need to, the main thing is basically has been covered. So any questions you have on your experiences, mostly you're gonna find this out on a plane, modern form of transport. Uh, you could find yourself on a ship, that can happen as well. It could be a boat, most likely, like if you're gone on a holiday and you're experiencing the Dubai Marina cruise or something like that, yeah? So whatever it is, you're enjoying yourself on a boat ride and it's a lot of time. And then in that scenario, it mentions here, if one prays the Fard Salah in a ship while sitting, even without an excuse, it is valid. Yet he must turn towards the Qibla every time he changes direction. Right? The reason why they mention here is because if you've ever been on a ship before, no matter how small or large it is, it moves with the waves of the ocean. Right? So there'll be some kind of instability in the uh, ride. So if you're standing up, you might be <coughs> thrown about a bit. Obviously, if you're just standing in one place, so hence the mention that you can't sit down and pray as long as you keep turning towards the Qibla each time it changes direction. But obviously, your salah will be quite short. Sure. You're going to read your farm, for example, and uh, it won't take that long that you need to turn that much. Next, the mention the prayer for traveler. So the prayer of a musafir. This is the minimum period for a traveler whereby certain legal rulings take effect is three days on a camel. This is where the foundational rule comes by. You know, like you have modern examples. If you travel, this book mentions 48. Uh, that's a, a weak, a very weak opinion. The actually, the more authentic opinions are like 57 miles. 59 miles, uh, 61 miles, around uh, that limit. This book does mention a Musafir is at 48 miles, but that's not like an authentic uh, like, or a strong opinion. The key opinion is for a Musafir, uh, for Salatul Mus uh, Musafir, or the condition for a Musafir to kick in, is about 57 miles. So he mentioned that it's how do they calculate this? Though? Why is there a difference? You know, some say 57, 59. It's three days traveling on, in a camel. So traveling on a camel for three days, the distance that would be covered, that would be considered as a musafir. Now there's so many variables in this. For example, some ulama might have tried this, but their camels were healthy, but the weather wasn't that good. Another group of ulama could have tried it, the, the uh, weather was good, but the camels were that fit. So there's so many, or oh, you know, it could be the train that they're walking on, the route they're taken. There's so many variables that will change this. But the average, including resting, praying your salah, sleeping. So the normal suffer that will be done within three days on a camel, that's what's considered. Right? So he mentions here that the minimum time to become a musafir is three days of a camel journey. I mean, we just stick with one opinion for, uh, to make it easier, we just say 57 miles, right? So if you were to travel 57 miles or more, you will be considered a musafir, a traveler. This is the Islamic speaking. Now our people say, you know, I'm going to London for a day out with my family, I'm a musafir, I'm a traveler, no you're not. Um, London is like 29 miles, depends which part of London you go. So, you won't become a Musafir just by driving down to London. Whereas if you go in like a north, a north, like to Birmingham, Manchester, which are beyond 57, 60 miles, then you're considered as a traveler. But you have to have the intention for that. Right, so if your intention, uh, you don't have the intention, then uh, obviously you're not a musafir. If you do have the intention, then the qasr salah or the you become a musafir as soon as you leave the boundary of your city. Hence, we're already on the boundary, you could say almost of Newton. So as soon as you get onto the M1, within one mile, you're past Newton, 
you run into like the countryside, you see farms and all the countryside around you, right? So within one mile, most likely. So as soon as you cross that boundary, and imagine you stop in the even uh, Tuddington service station, you stop. You're a musafir. Even if by Tuddington first, your first service station, as long as your intention is to travel more than that uh, minimum requirement. So if you're intending, for example, to go to London, if you're a taxi driver, I'll give a taxi driver example. You need to go to London to pick up a passenger, which is only 30 miles, and then drop them off to Belgium Garden City or something, which is within Luton, they're both within 30 miles. But if you add your mileage up, without coming, and not adding the return journey, this is just from here to London, and then London to where the job's gonna finish. Because now you already made the intention to do that journey. Now you're on the software. Right? If it's more than the required amount. Even though from Luton, you're still within 30 miles. So as soon as I go outside Luton, I know, uh, for example, someone who does Amazon delivery. And he's going to Milton Keynes. He's got a few drops in Milton Keynes. Then he's got a few drops somewhere else. And he knows his mileage is going to be more than the Musafir. And he's out of Luton. Automatically, he's considered Musafir because he knows when he sees his parcel, he sees his journey, where he's going to travel, he'll know if he's a Musafir or not. Uh, even though he might still be uh, within 10, 15 miles within Luton. As long as his journey from start to end is more than the suffer amount. Okay, so this applies to like, you know, a lot of people do delivery jobs these days, but it won't apply to do delivery within Luton. Right, within the boundaries of Luton, it won't be considered if you're a delivery driver. Okay, so now you mentioned the other. When a person has left his place of residence, i.e., his home or his city, like for example, Luton here, intending to travel at a medium pace to a place that he will reach in at least three days. Three days they mentioned here because of the camel example, this is. Right? But in modern days, it will be the 57 or 59 miles, whichever we take then he does not fast. Right? This is also linked to fasting as well. Your salah will become half if you're a musafir, and you have the option not to fast. But this is a common mistake which a lot of you know, youngsters, especially these TikTok uh, movies, right? These young guys who post in videos on TikTok and Instagram, Snapchat, and they misrepresent this masala. What do they say? That they woke up in just say the fifth of Ramadan, they're fasting, the boys, let's go on a mission to money. And they're making TikTok videos, they got a disputable McDonald's in their hand as well, right? So they're having McDonald's, KFC, that's one separation. And then at the same time, they're like, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the dispensation that we don't need to fast in Ramadan if we are Musafir. We intend to travel to Manchester and hence we're allowed to eat, so they're eating. This is misapplied, this masala is misapplied. The masala of a musafir not fasting, a traveler not fasting is at the time of suhoor. <clears throat> at the time of sehri in the morning, what's your situation then? So imagine sehri finish at 5 o'clock. And at 5 o'clock, if you're still at home, you, start, you have to start the fast, you've got no choice. Once you started the fast, you have to keep the fast now. <clears throat> but if Sefer is at 5 o'clock and you left your house at 4.45, you're two miles into the M1 on your journey, now you're a traveler. So when 5 o'clock hits, Sefer finishes, okay, you think, okay, it's 5 o'clock in a minute, I'm now I'm a traveler. Shall I start my fast? Do you, can I do it? Or shall I use the dispensation and not fast? So this ruling of not fasting in Ramadan is at the time of Sahari, what's your situation? So that'll be on day one. Would you have to keep up that fast? 
So any fast that you miss in that situation, you have to make up that fast, right? But obviously that struggle is going to be on the first day. So if you're traveling for five days, you're going on holiday to Spain, for example, right? First day you have that issue. If you set up from your home before Sehdi and you're out of your city boundaries before Sehdi, then you're a traveler. But if you're going to local, these cheap flights, right, Ryanair and all that, they're from Luton, you guys are lucky, but because you still have to fast if you're still sitting in the airport, right? So you can't miss the fast in that scenario. Why? Because you're still within your city bounds, even if you're my center from your home, you're still within Luton, you're still within the limits of your residential area, you're sitting at the airport waiting for your flight. As long as you haven't left your local resident area, you can't be considered as a Musafir. So you, if you're Sehli time, that's what's considered. If you're traveling at Sehli time, then you can miss, you have the option to miss the fast. You don't have to miss the fast, right? Because sometimes, the, you know, some journeys are easy, some are difficult. Sometimes, you know, like the fast might be in uh, winter time, which is a four o'clock, it's only like eight hour fast. Starts at eight in the morning you know, 7 in the morning and finishes at 4 o'clock. So it depends if you can bear with the fast or not. So obviously every scenario is going to be slightly different. So keep this masala in your mind and don't be breaking. And anyone who keeps the fast and then he says, I'm traveling and he eats, he's the kafara and he's got the rosa to keep and he's broken his fast, so he got 60 to keep as a punishment as well. Right? So uh, don't follow the TikTok uh, imams. Uh, so uh, the knowledge should be taken from, you know, direct from a teacher that you can question, that you, if you have any doubts, so you can uh, re-ask the question. If you're not sure, if you heard something else, you know, you can bring that up as well. But it shouldn't be from random uh, videos that people send you. Another thing that's mentioned here is that you shorten your full fard to two fard. So Fajr will become stay two, Zohar four far will become two far, Asr four far will become two far, Maghrib three far will stay three far, and Isha four far will become two far, and your three witr. Just as a side note, that originally, if we, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard this before, but originally the four far used to be two far, right? And so that's the original state. That the four font used to be two font. So when you're a traveler, they go back to being two. Now I'm a traveler. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran that when you're traveling, you can half or shorten your namaz. So I'm, I've traveled somewhere. For Zohar, instead of four, I'm going to be two. But if I think, you know, I'm too religious, I'm too pious, I'm still going to do my four. I'm losing reward because I'm going against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says read full, what do we do? We read half, we skip half of the namaz out. When Allah says telling you that you read half, I'm, you're traveling, this is my leeway, it's my mercy towards you, then people think, Kori, put it, put it, son. I'll read all of it, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Why? Because you're going against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when He says read half, and this also applies to when people go Umrah and Hajj. Why? Because you normally go less than 15 days, right? So if you're traveling this, here the minimum requirement was, if you're traveling 57 miles and your intention is less than 15 days, right? So even if you're going on a holiday to a different country, going for 14 days, going to Umrah for 14 days, you read half your namaz because you're a traveler. So even, obviously if you read with a local Imam, you follow the Imam, if he's reading full, you read full. If you're not following a local Imam, then and you're reading your namaz on your own, you read your namaz short. Even if you're reading in Saudi, in Madiya Shreve, Makkah Shreve, wherever you're reading your salah, it will still be a short term. So keep that in mind. It's a lot of people go on Umrah and they read the full namaz. The full, uh, even when they're not behind the Imam, like imagine they're in the hotel room, they're praying, they read the full namaz. That's not the way it should be done. If you're fasting in Ramadan and you go to a different country, would you, uh, would you follow the UK time or would you follow the different countries time? So, so, like you're in the Mars, anything that's linked to the time zone, like prayers linked to the time zone, isn't it? 
like with sunset, sunrise, midday. Same with fasting, suhoor, iftar has got to do with the setting and the rising of the sun. You open and close the fast according to the place of where you are at that time. Alright? So, sometimes people who are traveling, they end up keeping a fast which is quite long. If it's only 18 hours and then they're traveling the opposite way, then they're adding the hours, so it become, might become 19 hours, 20 hours and so on. They might lengthen their fast because of the time zones that they're going through. If you open in UK, will you close it when you open it wherever you're going? Or not going? That's fine. Yeah, so, but wherever you experience that time of the day, for example, sunset, you learn Asad here, you jumped on the plane, and wherever you come across sunset, that's Maghrib, right? So wherever your plane is flying over and the sunset is happening, that is where you pray Salat in Maghrib. And then when it gets completely dark, which is the Isha, wherever you come across that time, wherever the plane is flying, whichever country is flying over, soon as you come across night, then that's considered Isha has started. So you can either pray your Salah, then that's, that's on the plane, if your whole Isha is going to be on the plane, or you wait, get off the plane, and then you pray your Salah properly. If you have the time to pray properly. So then he mentions here, if he does not pray the full four of consequences. Okay, so he says here, if he does pray the full four, imagine he read four, either he didn't know or he thought it's too religious. Right? There's two scenarios. Either you just don't know and you get the full or you think you're too pious and you read the full, right? So then in that scenario, if he sat for the attahiyat in the first time, then, because what do we say? The last attahiyat is far, isn't it? The last tashahu. So if he's done the first one, which is supposed to be his last one, then his namaz will still be valid, right? The, so that's with generally with uh, normal namaz as well. If you, for example, uh, do nafal, you're gonna read two nafal. And you sat down on the second one, you forgot, you stand up, read third rakat, fourth rakat, and you remember that I was supposed to be leading two, not four. Even if you've done the four, the first two will be done as whatever if you're the sunnah, and the other two will be in the fun. Right? As long as you've done that sitting in the middle. He says, that the person should not shorten any other namaz apart from the four fard. So only the four fard will become half. Now there's a different uh, conversation that is to be had here. The one point is, one opinion, and there's two opinions on this, or well, there's three opinions. First opinion is, you only shorten the fard and you still have to pray the rest of the namaz. So your sunnah mu'akkadah, sunnah ghair mu'akkadah, you still have to pray those, only the fard becomes half. That's the first opinion. Second opinion is that if Allah is giving you a leeway and making your fard easy for you, then most definitely your sunnah and your nafal, they're going to be more relaxed, i.e. you can miss them, there's no issue with that. That's the second opinion. Third opinion, uh, which is like between the two. If you're still traveling on the journey, you do your fun. Like if for example, if someone's traveling to Scotland, obviously he's gonna stop on the service station. So he's mid-journey. Hence, he can only pray, he prays his two fun and he can carry on. But if you've reached a place where you're comfortable and you're relaxed, you got no issue really, but you're still a traveler, like you've gone to your relative's house in a different city and you're staying there for four or five days. Right? You're comfortable, you've got you know everything there. So in that scenario, if you're comfortable, you read full, i.e. the fard will be half and you read your sunnah and your nafal. But on the journey, you miss the sunnah and nafal. So if I'm traveling from here to Pakistan, then on my journey, I can just do half of the fard. So the two far, four fard will become two fard. I can leave my sunnah, I can leave all that out. 
apart from the two of Fajr, I shouldn't leave them out. Right? Yeah. Manchester, Charlie Manchester, so asal it depend like for example ek hai na ke usne irada kiya ki both of them are my house like me yeah? this is my house and in very near my house as well so technically they are because this is where i live now and that's we are be bought out my parents' house, I spend my whole life. So technically both of those are my house. So on the journey, if I'm going to do the Mars, I'll do half. But when I get to my destination, I'm back to from home one to home two. I.e. those people who are from Pakistan, for example, and they have their own makar, their own house, their family home, and if like, that is their home, they consider it their home. Then on the journey, they'll do half. And when they get to their home in Pakistan, they read the full namaz because they come to their Watani Asli, for example, right? But if you travel only for work purposes, that, look, I'm only there for work. If I, my work leaves me, let me, lets me go, I'm gone, I'm not gonna be here. So your intention is only to earn and work and come back. Even if you have to stay there, like for example, you know, people who work on planes, the one two days they stay in France, two days they stay in Germany, two days. It's like that, isn't it? It's for work purposes. So even if you travel to Manchester, stay four days, came back. If you don't have a house there, you're staying in a property that the business has given you, or the company has given you, or you're renting a hotel, then you're the Safir. So all in the bars from Luton boundary, back to Luton boundary will be the Safir. As long as your intention is less than 15 days. But if you're gone for a work, for example, you say you're working in Manchester, they say, you know what, you're going to be there for three weeks, 21 days. From the get-go, you know, I'm going to be stay in this place, in this building, in this apartment for three weeks. Now, you're not going to suffer. As long as your intention is less than 15 complete days. So in 14 days and 10 hours, you're still going to suffer. 14 days and 23 hours, you're still going to suffer. As long as it doesn't hit 15 complete days. Right, so if you start at 12 o'clock, you left the boundary of Newton. One day will be complete when next day hits top, that same 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. Right, so in that scenario that you mentioned, that person will be a Musafir in those four days he goes to work. As long as it's his for work purposes and not to uh, like his second house. Sometimes people get married twice. So they have to live in two different places. So they bought his house, bought up, then he's had to read the mass properly in all places. <laughs> and no shortcuts. And some, and the, why I mentioned the Pakistan scenario was a lot of people, they, and who born in Pakistan as well, their mom and dad's house is there. They go back to the same house they're born in, they raised in. And they said, Asad Musafir, Asad, the UK area. Right? right? And they, they still miss the full namaz. Why? Because I'm a traveler here, I'm just on holiday. No, holiday would be that you've gone, you live in Kashmir, Kotli or somewhere, and then you're chilling in Islamabad, in Apamba. Now you're on holiday. But if you've gone to a home that you're born and bred in, like, you know, that could be even in the UK if your parents live in a different city. And now that you moved out, but that is still your family home where you've spent the majority of your life, you're born there probably, right? That is still your home. Because that's your Watane Asli where you came from, the original place where you lived. Right? And this where you moved to your living is Bay for the Karma. See if it's your first time But in the, like for example, if you're never be your traveller, because you're not in your house in that sense. But if it's considered your family home, then you have to read your namaz. Right? So sometimes it's a joint property, like people don't do, uh, they don't give a rasat out. And still, two generations down, the uncles live in the same house when they go, your father lives in the same house, your mother might go live in the same house. But there's two, three, four, five families, you know, trying to, and it comes out the house probably, you could say, yeah. 
So, in that sense, then that won't be your house because it's not certified as your property or your house. So the next it mentions here that I've covered half this point, so let's keep it somewhere. Do you have any questions about why you've mentioned? Travel uh, behind the email. Yeah, uh, where's that? In the middle of 93. Okay, that's the Abu Okay, so when you go into 93, the rest on the top are covered already. So if you go on 93 near the bottom, uh, middle. Yeah, so if the traveler prays behind a resident imam, I slightly touched upon this as well. Within the prayer time, his prayer is valid. He must pray the full four rakas. So if you're a musafir, I can give you an example of a hajj or umrah. If you're reading your own namaz there, then you read half. If you're reading behind a local imam, obviously he's reading full, so you read full behind him. But if you're leading the namaz and he starts following you, right? So imagine you're the musafir, two people, you and your friends, these two youngsters, they're traveling and mashallah, they do jamaat in the masjid. Someone local comes in and he's like, you know, jamaat's happening, I'd rather join these guys. And then he realizes these guys just said two the whole time, I'm supposed to read four. So what will happen? He will continue and read two more. He still does his four because he's a local. Imam will stop after two and you will kind of read four, so you'll read as if you missed two. So you stand up and complete your extra two as well. About if you follow the local imam, let's say you go to a janaza in Birmingham and you follow the local imam for Zohar first, so it's okay to complete all four with you. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, so that, like for example, you go to janaza in a different city, imams you need four cuts for Zohar, you're going to need four for Zohar. But now imagine you've gone for a janaza and you read Zohar, it's us a time you're like, Chalo, we need to go back on the motorway, us three, four guys, let's read our namaz and let's, let's shoot off. So you're doing your jamaat and I'm thinking, maybe I walked in and I think, you know what, these guys are reading jamaat, so I'm not it now. And I join you, and then you finish after two rakas, I'm thinking, is it asal what these guys doing? I should know, okay, they got a reason, they must be travelers. I stand up and continue my two more. So I do four and you will do two as the field traveler. Another thing you mentioned here is, Oh, I just touched upon that last time as well. So another thing he mentions here, if you miss your namaz as a traveler, you complete it as a traveler, you know, kaza namaz. So if you miss kaza namaz, if you miss your namaz at home, four of kaza zohar, you're at home, you missed it, kaza will be four. If you were gone outside on a holiday or traveling, you missed your namaz on the way, if you missed it as a traveler, you do kaza as a traveler as well. Right? So if you missed it as two forms of traveling, when you make your later, when you get to your destination, even now that you're not a traveler, because the time you missed it, you were a traveler at that time. Right? So if you missed the namaz as a musafir, you read it as a musafir later as kaza, and then uh, if you missed it as a local person, you make it up as a local person as well. Then he mentions here that a traveler in a permissible journey or Okay, so here he mentions a side note. Someone and this youngsters do this unfortunately, like car theft for example, that people go to different cities to rob cars. Now they gone to a different city to rob a car. Uh, I'll just give like a real example, right? Now they gone on a journey to do haram. So even though they gone on the, the musafir as a journey and they're doing a haram action, the ru ruling of musafir will still be counted. Yeah, that's why he says here, if a traveler is in a permissible journey or a journey of disobedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. 
I saw one person, he's like, you know, he mentioned that he's maybe gone to a janaza in a different city. Now he's gone on a jai's permissible safar. So he can obviously show to his namaz that he mentioned the Quranic Kareem. Another guy, him and his boys are gone to rub some cars, to do, you know, whatever haram action, to attack someone in a different city. Now these actions are impermissible. But are they Musafids? Legally, they're still the Musafid. Why? Because they might go there and change their mind. Yeah, so technically, they're still Musafid Islamically. Right, so they in making intention that we go to Manchester and we're going to find this person, we're going to beat this person up. So now, the intention is haram, isn't it? Like to do a haram action, right? But is the intention to become a Musafid more than 57, 59 miles? Yes. So, on the way, once it is Zohar time, let me read Zohar, right? What should he do? Is he going to read two or is he going to read four? He will read two rakats. Why? Because he's a Musafi now. Yeah, so that's what they mentioned here. And inshallah, we'll stop on this. Um, there are a few weeks left until uh, Ramadan. So, inshallah, what we're going to do is uh, one or two more sessions on this chapter. Then we pause the chapter and we go to the fiqh of Ramadan. And before Ramadan starts, like the, at least we have three, four lessons of the fiqh of Ramadan before Ramadan starts. So we got quite a lot of pages left on Kitabu Salah, that's why. So we have a, the longest chapter is the chapter of prayer. So we've still got about 30, about 40 pages left. Uh, so some, what we do is inshallah, we'll start, we'll do one or two more lessons. Actually what we'll do is inshallah from next week, uh, I'll let you know, but most likely we'll start um, the Kitabu uh, song. So we'll start fasting for next week and then we'll continue after the, that chapter is finished in Ramadan. We'll go back to Kitabu Salah. So it's just good to refresh. Um, so it might most likely next week or the week after we'll start Kitabu song. And if you have any questions regarding the fasting or zakat, uh, just get them ready as well. Because most, a lot of people use zakat as well. We try to tackle both chapters. Uh, they're not very long at all, to be honest. So both of those is uh, twenty pages. So zakat and fasting. So we try to do them, and then after Ramadan we we'll come back to um, Kitab Salah. It's only about twenty pages. So inshallah, keep that in mind. Cause you get remind me. Uh, on my free myself. So inshallah, if any questions, just message me or.